Καλώς απόγευμα. I apologize, I have to speak in English. I've done my entire education in English, but I hope everybody will be able to follow. So thank you, Manoli, for the kind introduction. It's very good to be with you. Today, we're going to talk about one word and one word only. And that word is mutants. Now, let us all be honest with each other. We do not bring positive images in our minds when we think about mutants. We do not look at each other and say, oh, you look so mutant, or you're such a mutant, as a turn of endearment. And before I go any further, I need to make sure that you cannot tell everybody that you cannot catch a mutation. And no, you do not get mutations by spider bites. Just thought I'd put that out there. So, but culturally, for a very long time, we have considered a mutant to have a negative connotation. And, and the picture that you will see behind you is these horrible, monstrous creatures in, in some cave. In fact, as I was looking around to see appropriate pictures, I actually found a mutant zombie. As if being a zombie is not bad enough, you have to be a mutant zombie. Okay. <laughs> However, here's the thing. It is all not true. The word mutant simply means a change in DNA, and it does not have a positive or a negative qualifier about what it does. All it talks about is the fact that there's a position in your DNA that is different from what is the reference position, and we have known about this for the best part of 100 years since we started manipulating DNA in flies and other critters. And in many ways, we're all mutants, and I will come to that in a moment. So now we have the mutant misnomer. There's a second misnomer I would like to talk about. And the second misnomer is healthcare. This is where I work. This is where I'm privileged to be able to work. It's a wonderful place. But I would like to ask if anybody here has gone to the doctor lately and said, doctor, I'm feeling really well today. I'm feeling really healthy. Please help me. So in essence, healthcare is a beautification because in reality, it ought to have been sick care. <laughs> we care for the sick, not for the healthy. Yes, I understand that we aspire to be healthy, but really we look after the sick. So let's try to think about the problem of healthcare and sick care in a slightly different angle. It is true and it is appropriate that we spend significant amount of effort and resources throughout the world to care for the sick. Indeed, some will say that we're not spending enough, and I will agree with this. However, I would posit to you that it is just as informative not only to understand why people get sick, but it's also to understand why people who should be ill are not. Think about this for a moment. So here is a perhaps somewhat unsettling statement. A subset of us probably shouldn't exist, or we should be very ill as children, as neonates. And the reason for this is because some of the information that we carry in our genomes is predicting a catastrophic disorder from which we might not have been able to recover from. And yet here we are, able to enjoy each other's company. I think that is, well, wonderful, but I also think that it is interesting. Because if we can understand what it is that protects us from illness, maybe that will be an alternative path to new therapeutics to help people who are about to develop such illnesses. And I would argue that this is an area that we are under-resourced under and we have under-considered. Okay, 
So everybody's going, oh God, what's in the next slide? We're in Greece, my home country, and sometimes when I think about the archetypal Greek, what do I think about? Here is one of our beloved children, Dimitri Mitropoulos, but he seems to be doing a bit of this. <laughs> and it is true that many of us have a habit of smoking too much. We also eat late, and some of the things that we eat are not particularly healthy. There is gyro up there. There is kokoretsi. Uh, we just had Easter, yes? Um, some of you might know that the European Union has issued an advice against eating kokoretsi <laughs> because it is considered to be deeply unhealthy for you. But we do all these things, and we've been doing them for a very long time. And yet, and yet, and yet, we seem to enjoy among the lar largest longevity rates in Europe, we have much lower cardiovascular disease rates than you would have expected from our lifestyle, and we generally consider to be, well, hardy. Why is that? Well, there's a number of reasons. Of course, before McDonald's invaded our land, we enjoyed the Mediterranean diet, oils, fruits, nuts, fish, I cannot tell you anything more about this because I am a geneticist. I can't tell you a little bit about this because it is not just our diet that helps protect us from the evils of smoking and kokoretsi and all the rest of it. It is we now understand that we have changes, mutations in our DNA that are protecting us from some catastrophic disorders. Now, this is not new information, and it is a little bit puzzling that perhaps we're not spending as much time as we should. Consider this, red blood cells, they carry oxygen around your body, you need them, trust me. So we understand that when we have particular mutations that, causes, that cause these red blood cells to change shape, we get things like sickle cell disease, and the oxygenation of our tissue is reduced. That is a very bad thing. It's not comfortable. Unless you happen to live in a place in which malaria is endemic and has high frequency. Because if that is the case, those sickle-shaped cells actually protect you from malaria. So let us take a step back for a moment. We have a bad mutation that causes sickle cell disease that becomes a good mutation if you happen to, have a, to live in an area where malaria is very prevalent. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that there are no absolute, there's no absolute bad, there's no absolute good with mutations. A mutation is a mutation and it depends in what context you evaluated the type of information and help you might be able to get. So then, is it possible for us to use our genome not only to find these bad mutations, but also to find some good mutations that can help us? Well, it is. I have aspirational goals toward this, but this is not science fiction. This is happening in labs around the world right now. And by the way, if my lab is watching, I hope you're going to work right now. <laughs> Here are the covers of two very famous issues of the very well-known journals Nature and Science that in 2001 published the first draft of the blueprint of life, the human genome. It was a draft, but it worked very well. It took a best part of 10 years to decode one genome. And then what happened? Well, we did what we're really good at. We scaled, we miniaturized, we made things cheaper. It's no different from the old Cray computers to the thing that you got in your pocket now as your smartphone. It used to cost millions and millions of dollars. Now it cost a few thousand dollars and the cost continued to crash. As of right now, there's tens of thousands of genomes that have already been sequenced. And it's my prediction, and I assure you, it is not a visionary prediction that will say 
that within the next few years, we'll have hundreds of thousands and millions and eventually billions of genomes. Well, when that happens, we have an opportunity. In addition to finding all the changes in the genomes that make us sick, we can actually find some of the changes that make us feel better. Some of you might have heard about something called the blue zone. Blue zones are areas in the planet in which people live longer, and they don't just live longer, they live longer, healthier. The island of Icaria, some of you will see on this map, is one of them, where the mean individual, the, 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 the inhabitant of the island, will live an average of 10 years longer than, the, than um, elsewhere in Europe. Yes, we should seek out of the individuals, but we shouldn't just look for these blue zones. So here's the thing. As I look around you, I am confident to say that there's at least two or three of you whose genome is containing something that is deeply protective from catastrophic disease. I would actually argue that there's more of you than that, but I just don't have enough of a sense yet. So I'm thinking not just along the blue zones, but across the country, across the continent, and across the globe. As we start accumulating genomes, we're going to start finding these good mutants, people who should have been very, very ill, but they're not, and they're not because they have mutations in other genes and they protect them. Okay, that's good, that's great. You'll tell me that's eight billion of us, and I will say, well, yeah, that's good, but I'm a little impatient, that's not quite enough. Give me more, what else can we do? Well, we've been studying human genetic disorders for the best part of 100, 120 years. And one of the things that we do is we model these genetic disorders in a variety of animals. Mice, rats, fish, worms, flies, a, a, a whole host. And what we typically like to do is say, aha, there is a gene that when it's missing in a child, is causing a very severe metabolic disease. And I need to understand why. Well, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to delete exactly the same gene in a mouse, or a fly, or a worm, or a fish. And I'm going to recreate this disease in this model in such a way that I can study it. And I must tell you, we get more excited when we achieve that goal because now we have a malleable tool to study a disease. I would argue that we should get even more excited then we delete those genes in these model organisms and we fail to generate this disease. Why? Because the answer, the question then becomes, why is it that when a little baby is missing a particular gene, it's going to have a very dim future, and I consider that unacceptable, when I delete the very same gene in a rat or a mouse, and the mouse doesn't care? My sense is by understanding why these model organisms, these animals, have the capacity to miss these genes and still be healthy, will surely help us, guide us towards better therapeutics. And if we think a little bit broader, the planet, there's an enormous number of species around the planet and we are well on our way of sequencing all of them. We will have the genomes of thousands of species very soon. It is not a bold prediction to say that among the species, we're going to encounter mutations that in the human being cause catastrophe. But in those species, they are fully tolerated. Let us work together to understand the differences to understand why in a worm, or in a fish, or in an ant, or a giraffe, and I don't care what, a gene that causes a catastrophic disease in a human is actually tolerated. And yet you'll tell me, greedy, greedy, now all the species we have now, 8 billion humans and all the species in the planet, I hate to tell you this, but I'm still not satisfied. Scientists, by definition, are impatient. And we offer no apologies about this. So here's the thing, there is something else that we can do. And the other thing we can do is go directly into cells. The picture that you see behind you is just a picture of a cell. And it is quite tenable for us to obtain 
ill cells from every human genetic disease that has ever been discovered. For rare human genetic disorders, and this is something that is my passion, there's about 10, 12,000 of them, give or take. And if somebody said to me, let us establish cells from 12,000 human genetic disorders, I would say, well, that's hard, but it's not impossible by any stretch of the imagination. We do not need to invent technology, we just need to invest time. And time is something that we have a little bit of. And then what are we going to do? Well, we live in a brand new world, again, I'm sure my predecessors and the ones before said the same thing, and it's a wonderful thing about humanity, but it is true. We live in a world where for the first time ever, we have the capacity to edit the genome. Some of you might have heard about an enzyme, CRISPR, Cas9. The bottom line is, you can go ahead and at will, direct it, you can delete genes, you can change the lettering of genes, you can change the order of genes, you can pretty much do whatever you do. It's like Microsoft Word without the bugs, the hacking, and the virus uh, threats. But we can do this. So now, what you can do is you can take each of the 12,000 diseases that you have, and in each cell, go and systematically delete one gene at a time. And you can discover which genes, when missing, will actually protect, cure, restore the original dysfunction. And when you actually combine that with a pharmacopoeia that we have, you can have hyper-accelerated drug discovery. This is not going to work for every human genetic disorder, but I am convinced is going to work for a significant fraction thereof. And given that for genetic disorders right now, our therapeutic options are precious few and limited, I strongly welcome this bold idea. Because after all, sometimes it's good to be a mutant. Thank you. <laughs>